Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's topic, we will be looking at uh, OSHA's recommended practice for safety and health programs. My name is Annette Olison, and I am a certified industrial hygienist and a certified environmental trainer. I am part of the OSHA, Pennsylvania OSHA consultation program operated out of Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I have been with the program for the last 24 years and I have uh, been doing safety and health work for some 30 plus years. So um, uh, just some information about the seminar or about the webinar. Um, the, it is a PowerPoint presentation. If you have questions, you, need, you can post them in the chat. Uh, if for some reason um, we cannot answer the question immediately due to the nature of the question, uh, we will post the answer on our website within seven days of the webinar. So an overview of the webinar, uh, it provides a look at OSHA's publication number 3885 entitled Recommended Practices for Safety and Health Programs. We will discuss the different sections within the document along with how it's designed and the content of it. Uh, the goal of the webinar is to um, have attendees become familiar with the document in hopes of using it to implement safety and health programs within their own company organizations. So a little introduction. Um, OSHA recognized a need to update their 1989 safety and health program management guidelines, and this was due to several business sector changes. The nature of work has changed. Um, it has shifted from a manufacturing base to more of a service-based type industries. And also, um, we have moved from a fixed type workforce to possibly a more mobile workforce. Um, Work activities have become more uh, automated. We're implementing more computers and robotics within our workplaces. Also, we have uh, a workforce that's greater in diversity. We have several um, workforces that uh, have different speaking languages within it. We also have a changing workforce. Uh, I'm sorry, an aging workforce. Um, the um, aging for workforce might pose a higher risk for possibly work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Um, there are also changes for our, our typically our low-risk risk workplaces, uh, for example, healthcare, lodging, retail. These workplaces may face more significant hazards today. And also we have an increase in our temporary workforces. Um, we have, um, rather than the traditional relationship between workers and employers, we're shifting more over to, we have um, maybe uh, work, uh, employers and temporary uh, agencies placing a workforce within a company. So the uh, guideline is designed to help the small to medium sized workplaces in several different work environments. Um, it could uh, fo it focuses possibly implementation on the manufacturing side or even the construction side. Uh, it emphasizes a proactive approach to managing workplace safety and health and, and there's a continuous improvement component to it. Um, it also discusses the benefits of implementing a safety and health management system. Uh, talks a little bit about direct costs, indirect costs, uh, the uh, benefits from reduced workers' compensation um, uh, costs. So there are seven components within the guide or seven, seven core elements that they recognize. Um, inside the core elements are action items for employers and employees to take to establish and implement and maintain and improve a safety and health program. These core elements are interrelated so that one element affects another. They're not independent, but they sort of coordinate together. So some things to remember as you're implementing your programs is that uh, one size does not fit all. 
we have different workplaces out there. We have different sizes, we have different conditions, we have different hazards. So what one workplace may face, another one may not. And you need to fit your program to your organization. Also remember that worker participation is critical in developing and implementing every element of the safety and health program. Um, you know, workers have possibly um, a different perspective. They might have expertise or input into some of the uh, hazards that might be existing within the workplace. Keep in mind, you may be dealing with more than one employer. As I mentioned before, you know, we have host employers, we have contracting agencies uh, possibly in the workplace. So I'll talk a little bit more about this as part of one of the uh, core elements. But keep in mind, you have to make sure that you include these additional employers into the program. So let's talk about the first element or the first core element. Um, and this is probably one of the most important ones, management leadership. Program does not really get established unless this one is solid. Uh, management needs to uh, communicate their commitment to safety, safety and health. Um, they do this by establishing a policy, making safety part of business decisions, and setting a good example. When they walk the floor of the workplace, do they have all their PPE on? Are they having conversations with employees about safety and health and their concerns? Also, there needs to be some goals set, realistic and measurable. And then after the goals are set, establish an action plan. Where are you going to go with your program? How are you going to get there? And set some timelines. Allocate resources. Management needs to make safety and health part of their budget and allow time for employees to participate in safety and health, meaning when they're uh, help um, give them time to conduct workplace inspe inspections, give them time to attend safety committee meetings. Um, also, management needs to expect performance. They need to establish roles and responsibilities for management, supervisors, and employees. And then they hold them accountable um, to those roles and responsibilities and provide positive recognition um, on you know, how they are doing within the program. So pos positive recognition may be if they're reporting close calls or near misses, if they're attending trainings, and if they're conducting workplace inspections. Those are all good positive recognition um, aspects to a program. The next component is worker participation. So encourage workers to participate in the program. You can do this by giving them the time to do it and acknowledge those who do participate. There needs to be an open door policy established so workers feel comfortable coming forward with some safety and health concern. Um, encourage workers to report those concerns. Have a process in place for them to report them and provide them feedback how, how, what happened after I reported this issue? What's going on? Is there any action being taken? Empower workers by establishing an environment where there's no retaliation for reporting. Um, and give them access to safety and health information. They need access to the safety data sheets, injury and illness data, possibly inspection reports, exposure monitoring if there's been air or noise monitoring in the workplace. Post these so that they can see them. Involve workers in all aspects of the program. Involve in setting goals, establishing, safe, establishing safety procedures, for, in, in conducting inspection and incident investigations. Um, don't remove the barriers to participate. Um, no matter what their skill set is or their language, involve them, encourage them to participate, and provide feedback. The next is hazard identification and assessment. So under this core element, what we wanna do first is look at OSHA, uh, NIOSH, CDC, trade organizations for information about hazards within your particular workplaces. Um, evaluate any previous incidences or any exposure monitoring results that you've already conducted. 
and ins then inspect the workplace, make regular document inspections and have a checklist to use. Watch for changes. Uh, a, work a workplace can change without anybody noticing any new hazards arising, but look at that and make sure that if that does occur, you take a step back and identify those hazards. Identify health hazards might be a little trickier than the safety hazards. Um, so health hazards, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, chemical, physical, biological, ergonomic. The chemical, you know, you're going to redo, review your safety data sheets. Um, you know, you could have physical hazards, like you could have excessive noise issues. You want to look at any sources of radiation. Um, Biological, you want to determine if there are any sources of infectious diseases or molds. Um, also identify any ergonomic risk. Um, you want to look at any lifting activities, repetitive motion, or significant vibration issues. You, uh, you want to conduct any exposure assessments um, to evaluate any noise or, um, or uh, airborne hazards. Um, review medical records. Um, these may be to identify cases of musculoskeletal injuries, skin irritation, dermatitis, hearing loss. And then also conduct incident investigations. There needs to be a procedure in place and also training. Not everybody uh, has the background and the expertise on how to do this. Um, so it's critical that some training be provided if they're going to be, if somebody, whoever it is within the workforce, um, has the knowledge and skill and capabilities of doing, of doing this. Identify the hazards uh, with any emergencies and non-routine situations. Um, these uh, hazards could be fires, chemical releases. Look at your infrequently performed activities. Generally, there's some maintenance activities that may uh, pose um, an additional hazard. Uh, for example, cleaning a vessel or a tank, you're going to be possibly entering a confined space, which typically would not be done in a normal, normal workplace activity. You need to be looking at you know, weather issues, um, medical, how are you going to address any medical issues, and then also workplace violence. Characterize the nature of the hazards. Um, what you're going to use for interim, interim controls and prioritize the controls. So when you're looking at prioritization, you want to be looking at how, how, how likely will, it, will the hazard occur and what would be the severity, or severity from the exposure. So the next part is hazard prevention and control. So once you've identified your hazards, you need to put some kind of control in place to prevent uh, an injury or illness from occurring. So you want to identify control options. Employee input is critical. You need to get employees to provide input on, hey, you're, you're, you're doing this job activity every day. Give me some input. What do you see as far as a, a, a good control option? Seek safety and health experts. Um, here at the Pennsylvania OSHA Consultation Program, we um, are a free service offered to small employers in the state of Pennsylvania. So we are a resource. Another um, possibility is to reach out to your insurance carrier. Lots of times they have loss control experts who would come on site and, and evaluate uh, control options for you. You want to select these controls based on the hierarchy of controls. You can see a diagram there on your right, which is a description of the hierarchy of controls. So at the top of that controls are the most effective controls. You want to start there first. So you want to eliminate the hazard. Next, you want to substitute the hazard. Um, then the next is engineering controls, which means you isolate the hazard. Administration, administrative controls would be change the way people work. And the last least effective is personal protective equipment, which is usually the first um, place most people go because it's the is easiest um, option, but it is the least effective. These are 
you know, providing uh, safety glasses, face shields, hearing protection. So um, you wanna use this as a guide as far as selecting your controls. Develop and update a hazard control plan. So once you've select controls, you wanna assign responsibilities and completion dates on implementation of these controls. And then you wanna do a check back and verify how effective they really are. So as I described in the hazard identification, you also wanna select controls for your non-routine tasks and your emergencies. Um, you want, for your non-routine tasks, you want to look at things before the work begins. Um, if you have a scheduled shutdown, uh, you want to look at, you know, controls of any activities that would be going, be going on during a shutdown. Um, also for emergencies, you can conduct drills, routine drills to make sure that your assembly points are still, still good and, and, and your exit routes are still um, good routes for people to take in an emergency. Um, follow your established plan and look at your risk and, and severity, severity and prioritize based on this. Um, you may not be able to implement all controls immediately, but again, you wanna look at the severity and the risk of the hazard that is there. Uh, follow up and confirm that the controls are effective. Uh, go back to your workers, get feedback and modify things if needed. Training and education should start with an, aware, an awareness training. Um, awareness training, topics such as program policies, functions of the program, who does what within the program, and who do people go to to ask with question, to contact with questions when they want to find out about you know, a specific policy within the, within the company regarding safety and health. Um, you're gonna train uh, workers or employers, managers, supervisors on their roles in the program. You want them to know about the OSHA Act, how to respond to an employee concern, and what controls are in place already for the specific hazards that they deal with. And then train the workers on their specific roles within the safety, pro safety and health program. They're going to need to be able to Identify, identify and recognize hazards and the controls that are in place. Uh, if they're involved in incident investigations, that may be part of their training. Um, also give them knowledge on program improvements. What, has, what the goals are within the program? Um, how far along are we within uh, completing our goals? Train workers on hazard identification and control would be if you have job hazard analysis in place, you want to review these with the employees, make sure that they're knowledgeable about uh, these, these, this analysis. Um, you want them to know what types of personal protective equipment they need to put on to perform a certain task, how to report hazards, and about those hierarchy controls I mentioned before. Um, they need to understand the concepts of you know, where they are on that hierarchy and how they can move higher on the, on, the, um, on the scale. Program evaluation and improvement. So here you wanna monitor the performance and progress. You want to track your, leading, your lagging and leading indicators. So um, some examples of lagging indicators would be the number and severity of injuries and illnesses, um, results from worker exposure monitoring, maybe your workers' compensation data. This is all lagging. This is things that have happened already. It's the reactive approach. What you wanna focus on are your leading indicators. Um, those, those things are how many, uh, some examples of those are how many uh, employee safety suggestions have you gotten? How many near misses have been reported? Um, how long does it, does it take to respond to a safety concern reported? Um, so again, these are all proactive things and this is where you wanna focus because this is gonna prevent the injuries and, and illnesses from occurring within the workplace. You wanna share this with the employees also. They need to 
understand that the significance of these leading indicators and are, how important they are to the safety and health within the company. Um, verify that the program is implemented and is operating. Um, you want to um, track your progress on achieving those safety and health program goals that you've just established uh, and verify that the key, that key processes are in place. Those key processes might be a mechanism to report injury, illnesses, and incidences. Uh, that's workplace inspections are being conducted. And there's some sort of tracking mechanism to make sure that the hazards that have been identified during inspections um, have been corrected and, and taken care of. The next is to correct any program short, shortcomings and identify opportunities to improve. Um, you know, workplaces changes. Uh, you know, there might be uh, some new equipment uh, put in, new material, new material used. There might be key personnel that have changed. So you got to reflect back and make sure that um, current conditions are still in place. Communication and coordination for host employers, contractors, and staffing agencies. Kind of mentioned this in the beginning of the webinar where we need to really es establish an effective communication between these groups. Um, we, um, we have to make sure we are communicating the job hazards and controls, how to report hazards and what to do in an emergency. Coordination might be to make sure that we have our bid and contract document specifications up to date. We might need to harmonize our safety and health policies between our staffing agency and, and the employer or even the contractors that might come into the work site to do a specific job activity or, or service, um, service call within the workplace. Um, be prepared for staffing needs and changes. Make sure if you, if you need more staffing that you reach out to your staffing agency to determine uh, what those needs are. So the last thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is are the resources that are available. Um, OSHA has a dedicated webpage to support the implementation of these recommended practices. This is a very powerful tool. Um, the link is right there uh, on the on the screen, and there's a screenshot of the um, of the front page of the website. So here on the left hand side, uh, if you click on any one of those buttons, you it will dump you into another uh, more valuable information possibly that could assist you with developing the program. So I just want to explore two, two of these. Uh, there's the, I want to explore the Explore Tools button and the Additional Resources button. So under the, uh, the Explore Tools is there a um, couple different important, uh, significant, I think, helpful items under there. So the first one is the Safety and Health Program Existing OSHA Standard Crosswalk. So underneath this, um, and I put a little screenshot in there so you could see it. Um, so it, it actually um, on the left-hand column is, you know, the standard or, and an overview. So let's look at ladder. So, you know, we're, we're looking at, again, the relationship between the OSHA standards and these safety and health core uh, program elements. So if you're looking at ladders, you're gonna look at hazard, identification and assessment. So under those would be OSHA's 1910.25 series and 26 and 27 on ladders. And then controls, hazard prevention and control. What do they say about, uh, about hazard prevention and controls as it, relates to, um, as it relates to ladders within those standards? So I think another really good uh, tool is the Safety and Health Program Voluntary Standards Crosswalk. So that takes, um, existing safety and health program standards, guidelines, and recommended practices, and it crosses it between the core elements. So I just took a screenshot of the safety or the uh, management leadership section. So it walks you through OSHA's 2016 recommended guidelines on uh, 1989, VPP, 
um, the International Laborers Organization um, guides, the ANSI guides, National Safety Council, and then ISO. So again, gives you their, their perspective on what should be part of each one of these components. So there's also self-evaluation checklists, there's implementation checklists, audit checklists, and then I this um, there's another document in there called a leading indicators uh, guidance document, which um, is set up very similar to the recommended safety and health practice uh, document or safety and health program document. Um, I took a little screenshot of example leading indicators and how you're looking at your indi leading indicators and you're setting up your safety and health goals. So under here, it's you. Um, there's good examples and bad examples of different goals. So you want them again, specific, measurable, accountable, reasonable, and timely. So it gives you some examples in there on how to set that up. So additional resources, there's actually under there, we have um, a way to search by core element or by topic. So if you look at the left-hand side of your screen, um, if you clicked on any one of those core elements, it'll dump you into another whole series of different information that can help you. So under, if you can see at the bottom there, under management leadership, um, it has, you know, if you clicked on that, the first topic there is 2016 CEOs who get it. So you might find that article useful or helpful. The other option is you could do it by topic. You can search by topic. So um, you can, maybe you're after, um, you know, a model program and you wanna look at that. Maybe you wanna look at some case studies where companies have implemented safety and health programs and the benefits from those programs. So to summarize, uh, a safe workplace is a sound workplace. Um, there is um, a safe workplace, prevents workplace injuries and illnesses. It imp improves compliance with laws and regulations. It reduces costs, signif uh, including significant reductions in workers' compensation premiums. It engages workers and enhances their social responsibility goals and increases productivity and enhances the overall business operations. So um, this here is a little bit about a little bit about uh, Pennsylvania OSHA consultation. This is a screenshot of our our web page, our website. Um, as I mentioned be mentioned before, it is a free uh, service open to small employers in the state of Pennsylvania, and small can be less than two hundred fifty at one location or less than five hundred nationwide. So you can go to our website and submit a request. Um, and then one or two consultants will be assigned to you. And that consultant will reach out and set up a date and time to come to your workplace and um, provide assistance to you on safety and health hazards. So this is how to contact us. Um, we have a 1-800 number. We have our website that I just uh, showed you a little screenshot of it. We have a Facebook and we also have a Twitter account. So our upcoming webinar uh, is uh, topic is safety and health program assessments. Uh, kind of a nice follow-up to this particular topic. Um, and that will be conducted on December 15th, 20, 2021 at 1030. And um, there again is our 1-800 information and our website. So just thank you for coming. And I hope that this information was um, helpful to you.